So, hello and uh, welcome to the Teddy Talk Queer Web Part 1. I'm uh, very happy to be here also and I'm going to um, introduce you, but uh, first of all I'm going to make an introduction, what is it about? So the Queer Web Series is about exploring, analyzing and connecting elements, initiatives and organizations that can strengthen the queer film network from production to programming, networking to training and exhibitions to archiving, like it's a lot. And today we begin um, by navigating existing organizations that support people within the industry, from collaborative collectives, uh, initiatives to training programs set up to strengthen connections from within. Uh, by coming together, we look to analyze existing power structures and discuss how each of us, through our work, can collectively go about demanding changes. So a lot again, but I think maybe it's a first start. And um, just um, for everybody who is here and also for the people online, um, so you know how I understand moderating. I understand moderating and inviting people to share thoughts. So I don't have like a big list of questions and so on. I would really like to invite you to think collectively and um, share your thoughts on different topics and that we have a great chat together and you're also invited uh, if you have questions or comments just um, say a word and if you want you can come closer then it's more cozier and we sit all on a kitchen table and uh, <laughs> I will now uh, start introducing you to our guests uh, unfortunately Chris Belloni uh, cannot be with us but I start uh, from my from my right, so you're left with um, Alice Blanc. Um, Alice currently works in TV distribution at Fifth Season. The company is known for its works such as Severance, Conversation with Friends, Killing Eve, among many others. Alice founded Trus a Trans Plus on screen less than a year ago, a directory for trans and non-binary professionals in film and TV. Uh, they also sit uh, on the committee board of the Iris Prize Film Festival and the advisory board of BIFA, British Independent Film Awards. Their next uh, goal, becoming a producer and help more filmmakers getting their works seen by the wider audience. Welcome, Alice. <laughs> Lucy Mukherjee. Uh, is a queer British Indian film curator, community builder, programming dis disruptor. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, dedicated to elevating the careers of underestimated storytellers. Her area of um, expertise is the intersection of activism and the arts, specifically the programming and uh, inclusion meet. Over the, her 20 plus year career, Lucy has produced films, programmed festivals and overseen artist development programs all over the world, including with Outfest, uh, Tribeca, Wildscreen, and Doc Leipzig. She is co-founder of the Programmers of Color Collective, a network of 400 BIPOC film festival programmers around the world. Happy to have you here. So, uh, Andrea Schütte uh, has a, a university degree in English, German, political science and media studies, as well as postgraduate post degree in film studies. She worked as a producer at one of the leading independent production companies in Europe, X-Film Creative Pool in Berlin, for seven years before funding her own company, Hamburger Tam Tam Film, in 2000. For the past 10 years, Tam Tam Film has been producing feature films, uh, um, feature films, both feature and documentary, and series that explore stories from the fringes. Queer storying is one of the pillars of this work, and you're also part of the Queer Media Society. Happy to have you here. <clears throat> And uh, my name is Nastaran Tajeri Fumani. I am a non-binary moderator, activist, musician, and also lecturer, researcher, and for eight months now a queer parent also. <laughs> 
And uh, my main focus is on political issues such as uh, intersectional queer um, feminism, social justice, and also anti-racism and anti-discriminatory practice uh, in film and also um, in art. And besides that, I'm uh, yeah part of Exposed Queer Film Festival for more than, I don't know, more than 10 years, I think, um, in various positions and um, right now focusing a lot um, in the film industry when it comes to um, anti-discrimination um, consultation on set, but also when it comes to the whole process of uh, film production. So, and I would uh, really love to start um, by asking you um, if you could just briefly introduce us to your um, networks and uh, all the activist um, works that you are doing right now um, so that we can, um, yeah, kind of share it now within this um, panel so that everybody knows what's going on in the scene, yeah. Whoever wants to start, yeah. I go first? Oh, okay. Um, I do, as you said, represent the Queer Media Society, which has been, which was established four years ago. I mean, time is such a, blurry thing right now, but four years ago, just before the pandemic, um, 2019, at Berlinale, I was, I'm not the founder, but I'm a, a member since then, and um, the Queer Media Society is um, not only limited to activism toward, in, in film, but in all um, divisions of media, and um, we're a group of individuals, all queer, um, who just try to, to make queerness more visible in all the media fields, since we are working with all the all the means to to expose ourselves. It was quite a a clear thing to do, and yet it took us a while to get established. And I think the two main um, things that the Queer Media Society did since then was um, being part and and initiated a, a survey called uh, Diversity in Film, and also um, we encouraged our fellow queers um, in acting to to come out to the public with a, um, with a very courageous move. Um, they all, they, uh, it was called Act Out. I don't know, maybe the Germans among you have heard it and um, that was also three years ago, I think, that um, they openly and publicly came out um, to the public in order to just overcome obstacles and be seen as, as the way they are. So this is mainly what the um, Queer Media Society does and me being part of it and also being a producer, I'm just promoting the, the cause and in the way we do, we choose our project and um, our projects and um, the way we just address everyone else who's, who's a part of it. Thank you. Um, yes, so I've been, um, for the last decade, I've been programming at various film festivals and before that producing. Um, but five years ago, uh, I founded with three friends, uh, the Programmers of Color Collective, um, which is, uh, well, our, our intention was to build visibility for BIPOC film programmers around the world. Um, the, the goal of programming inclusion was not just sort of on screen at festivals, but also on staff, because those two are like obviously very closely linked together. Um, and so my co-founders, Temba Bebe, who is here at EFM, um, Hussein Karimboy, who at the time was at Sundance, and Paul Struthers, who was at Frameline, um, we're not uh, explicitly a queer group, but three of the four founders are queer, so there you have it, so many of the members are. Um, we have around, it's a growing group every day, we get new members and new inquiries, which is really exciting. Um, but right now we have almost 400 members around the world. Um, and the reason this is significant is because um, in our experience, a lot, of, um, a lot of times when you're working at a festival and you identify as BIPOC and queer, you're usually the only one on the team who identifies that way, and it's a very solitary, isolating, um, stressful uh, position to be in. And so this group sort of provides a network of support and solidarity, and we use that um, network to lift each other up, to find ways to celebrate each other, to um, you know, uh, find, uh, share job opportunities, speaking opportunities, um, 
last night we had a, a meetup for some of the members and we're, we're doing it again tonight and it's just such a joy to be able to meet in person and kind of feel that we, we, even if it's the first time we're meeting, we get each other on a very deep level because we've, we're going through this work together. Um, one of the, the reasons that we felt the need to start the group was that we were hearing from so many festivals that um, they would justify their all-white programming teams and all straight programming teams by saying that they didn't know where to find diverse programs. And so we were really inspired by a group that's US-based um, called Brown Girls Dark Mafia which have done an amazing job of um, building visibility for um, black and brown women in the industry. And they have a, you know, a database on, the we on their website that sort of shows where people are located and who's available for hire and that sort of thing. And that, we realized, is what we needed in this field. Thank you. Um, well, just like you said, um Trans on Screen started off because <clears throat> there was this uh, constant um, excuse of not knowing where to find trans people and therefore not hiring them. And so we started off as a, it's a directory uh, accessible to all. Um, and we, you know, we have people that work across all departments from pre-production, production, distribution, writers, actors, consultants, um, mental health advisors, um, and we're really pushing for not diversity just you know in front of the camera, but especially behind. Um, and now we have, I would say, 150 members, which is pretty good. Um, and over the past few months, uh, we have also explored... <laughs> um, we, we have um, explored ways to... Um, create, um, for instance, this uh, writer's lab. So opportunities for trans people to gather together and talk about, you know, what they're working on and also bring in, you know, people from uh, acquisition teams, agents, uh, casting directors to come and talk to them. Uh, and, and yeah, just share as well um, skill set among each other, but also through the people that are at the moment holding that power. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing. You know, it's a directory, which um, one of the main, I would say, well, two things. First, we're not an agent, and that's super important for us to, to, to say. We do not take any commission from any jobs that we share, because we believe that that's your work. You should be entitled to 100% of what, you're, um, what you're, you're supposed to earn. I don't know if I can say it like that. Um, and second of all, when we receive a job through the website, we double check if it's good to go. Um, and when I say we, I send it off to, you know, people around the, the directory because my experience is not just, you know, um, I don't represent, let's say, the directory. Everyone kind of had their own opinion, experiences, um, and then they can say, yes, let's go. Like, you can, you can send out these opportunities to, uh, let's say, writers or uh, absolutely not, because let's say um, someone might say, well, this is, this is actually you know, not representing the disabled community or the black community or people that have you know, transitioned in the 60s or 70s. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you for um, introducing and going also into like the history and also the urgency why uh, to do this, because what I right now heard um, that is kind of in every, in every um, uh, uh, yeah, collective or institutions that you are in is that um, it's also about safety and about um, I don't know, being in some kind of a business that is also very excluding and when you're in there, 
you need support. I mean, you, you said, you know, we, we lift each other up. We try to talk things through. And um, Alice, you also said, you know, like um, to check if how, how, how is the re representation then uh, when it comes to these positions and so on. Um, what do you think, what has to change so that um, people who have been othered or in like being put in marginalized groups um, within the communities or within the industry uh, can feel safe. What has to change? I'm happy to go with that one. Um, so first, I think in order to to understand like how can you um, how can you change, you need to understand the um, how power works in this industry. There's been some, you know, um, and that's why we have all these terms like below the line, above the line. Uh, that's why we tend to treat the cast in a certain way and then the crew in another. That's why when we go to a festival, it's always the same type of people that are, you know, um, on a panel, let's say. Uh, so once you start understanding that, you also understand why trans people were not, and I'm talking about trans people, and m maybe this is also the same with, you know, and, and it is the same with other minorities, obviously you can then understand why some trans people do not have, um, let's say, certain roles such as, in the UK at least, producers, um, directors of features, and I'm not talking about shorts, directors for high-end TV, um, main, uh, main role in a you know, big blockbuster movie, you know? And once you start understanding that, why they're not there, you can then understand that when people are looking to hire and say, I'm gonna try and hire, let's say a trans person, but I want all these credits, they're not there. So once you start understanding that, and once you start saying, okay, they're not there because for so many years we haven't given them this chance, then you can maybe start changing the way you hire them. So for instance, if right now someone was to say, I'm looking for a director that have done, let's say four film, feature film, and they can't find it, then maybe they can, hire a AD that is trans, and together you will hire the trans director. And together you can then say, okay, cool. Let me hire someone that will be higher than me. So you're dismantling this idea of what power means, first of all. And then together you can work on this film. This trans person will then get the right credit to then one day make you know, their first directorial de debut. And then the story might be accurate. The story might be, you know, the, the, the right way of doing it. Because you understand as well as the cis director that this AD that is working with you will help you. And, and you have to listen and you have to think, I'm not here, I'm not his boss or he's not mine. We're together on the same project to make sure that what we're gonna show after on screens is not gonna be disrespectful towards trans people and it's gonna be the right representation for um, what they need to see and what cis people need to see. When I think about what needs to change, I think about when I um, take on a new programming position and I open up the submissions and I go looking for the queer and trans stories and looking and looking and looking, and there's so few of them. And I've noticed in the decade that I've been doing this, um, there are fewer every year, and that really scares me. So that feels like an urgent situation that needs to be addressed. And it's obviously a matter of financing connecting queer artists, queer storytellers with the funding to be able to tell their stories. Um, I personally like daydream about overseeing a, a queer film fund where I can connect artists with queer artists and trans artists with the resources that they need. Um, I, don't, I haven't found that initiative, that program yet. I, I see a lot of uh, so-called diversity funds that push uh, emerging filmmakers into making yet another short film that's not necessarily very helpful for their career. And I see queer filmmakers who figure out how to find the means to make a feature and then spend the next decade kind of figuring out how to do it all over again. And it's an exhausting, extractive process because there's no resources or system in place mm -hmm. to help. So for that reason, I'm sort of in my mind, brainstorming how I can get closer to the funding side of things. Because once you're sitting in that sort of gatekeeper position at a festival, it's almost too late. The films that you want, to, that I want to champion, did not get funding, so they have not been made, so I can't program them. 
I would absolutely agree, and I would just um, add to that that the decision makers have to change. If you ask me who's, what has to change, then at the very beginning with the funds, if you're, if you're um, producing out of the funding system, then you have to have people representing yourselves and your stories and in the, within the, within the um, boards or within the juries. If that's not the case, then it's always an outside view. And then stories might be assessed as quality stories or not, but they could not, many juries don't have the, um, have the inside view. And so we do need people within the, the commissions and within the juries to have the inside view and to provide. And also to fight for the stories. Because it's not, it's, it's not very useful. I mean, you need to have allies and they have to be there. And they cannot come at the very end when it comes to distribution or programming or festivals. It has to be at the very beginning to enable stories to be told and to be made. And to... I, 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 I would not so much say to have a queer um, funding institution. I would say that queer stories should be funded equally and they shouldn't be marginalized by funding. They should be a powerful um, element of, of the regular funding system. So that, I think, would have to change and needs to change. I think a lot of the funders are just so accustomed to saying, oh, we already have a queer film, we already have a trans film, or we made one of those and it didn't do very well for us, so we're not going to do that for a few more years and it's it's really frustrating um i was just going to add that i when i left the queer festival to join a mainstream festival i did so because i wanted to see these queer filmmakers that i had seen so well received by audiences at outfest and new fest i wanted to see them on a mainstream platform i wanted to see them get reviewed in variety and um, get picked up by the distributors who weren't coming to the queer circuit and what I found was, even when I was able to find and program queer content, um, unfortunately, the, the film critics didn't review those films because they didn't necessarily have the language to critique a trans documentary or uh, maybe they, the straight white man reviewing the lesbian coming of age movie didn't get it. What a surprise. And so didn't give it a very good review. And so those films that I was pushing forward ultimately didn't have the best experience because they didn't get reviewed and they didn't get um, acquired by distributors a lot of the time. Um, and so I was, I, it helped me sort of understand that this is a much more complicated, nuanced situation that we have to really figure out how can we support our filmmakers? What is it that you need? What is it that um, is missing from the ecosystem? And, and just to follow up on what you said, I think here the issue was clearly that they do not have queer uh, film critiques, you know? <laughs> and once you start hiring that as well, um, then you can say, okay, because, you know, it's, it's, I think there's this thing where sometimes people are too anxious to talk about certain issues that they're not sure of. They think that they're gonna get, you know, um, criticized or they're gonna say the wrong thing when, actually, first of all, you just have to ask. You just have to have that conversation with someone and you realize that maybe because you've dehumanized them so much, you just think that they're gonna react to, you know, in a certain way. But then like in this case, they should have hired, they should hire more, um, let's say queer film critiques to then have those conversation and then review it and then, you know, they will have, because at the end of the day, when, you, when you're when you reading Variety, you don't know who's queer, who's not, right? It's just a name. I mean, you will see John Smith a lot, but that's it. That's a different <laughs> story. Um, but like, you know, you're, you're, and, and once you read that, you can be like, wow, this is actually a super cool film. I'm gonna watch it, because the queer person behind understood exactly what, oh, well, yeah. They understood what they were trying to show. And again, like it's, it's that's why hiring should be across all department and really all of them including and sometimes people don't think about that marketing like there's so many trailers right now that are going out and they're trying to clickbait or they're trying to show certain aspect of the movies just to get clicks and then after that it's just I mean you see gross like stuff you know and it's out there and it's like wow you really didn't understand my story and you just made it like this thing that is a bit like just to get a click and then you read the comments and it's just, you know. So it's like, that's what we mean by hiring everywhere and not tokenistic hires. Not one, and I'm gonna put their pronouns out there. You know, you will see like the cool she and it's just one day them and you're like, oh my God, this is a lot. You know, it should be like everywhere and then things will happen. And this again applies for every single 
um, like community, even if your film is not about, um, again, like the disabled community, you should also hire them. You should also have that across all departments. And, um, you know, while you were talking, I, I was also thinking about so many contexts where I am invited to, you know, help those people to have like a visibility in this or that. Why are the people not there? Like the, the questions you were also um, raising. And I was also wondering, you know, because I always ask, okay, when you think of the first 10 people in your mind, who are they? Are they able-bodied? Are they white? Where are they from? You know, like, like, is there classism or whatever? You know, like, where are these people from? And when you go beyond that, you understand society, you know, and then you know, oh, we don't find them. No, you don't see them and you don't invite them in, you know. So it's another context. And I very f fast come to the solution, and I know it's not an easy solution, and it's maybe on also not the right solution, but what about quota? Like, what about saying, okay, the representation, I mean, you, you made a very big uh, research on how, like, diversity in Germany is, like, not there in the film and all over, and also in the different departments and so on. What about um, asking for a quota in different, you know, categories or whatever? Um, I come, I, I'm not from Berlin, I come from a region in Germany um, Which is, which is Hamburg, or Hamburg Schleswig-Holstein, where the fund um, set up a diversity checklist. It's not a very nice word, checklist, because it feels like checking the marks, but it still, um, it, it, is, it raises that question, or at least it raises awareness, because um, every producer who applies for funding in all stages, development and production, and I think also distribution, they have to we don't as producers apply for our distribution but the distributors do and we have to um, fill in this dis um, diversity checklist and um, all categories of being a minority are being are being listed there and you have to um, you have to in a way check if your story or if your if your story so before the camera and your team um, represents some kind of diversity. And um, there was a big discussion when it was set up because those who felt being excluded by this um, tool of inclusion, um, they suddenly felt marginalized and said, if I don't tick all the boxes, will I get funding? Right now, it's not, it's not sanctioned. If you, I mean, if you don't tick any of these boxes, um, you might get funding anyways, but I, because there's not, a, there's not a point system or something, so you don't have to check five boxes in order to get fundings, but everyone, everybody is thinking about it. And so maybe those, even those who are um, not as much marginalized as others, they start to think of, well, maybe I should make a film about aged people who are not represented well in at least German cinema, or maybe I should f make a film about more, more queer people, or what about classism. And um, that is a soft quote, I would say, and it changes the awareness and um, it helps it helps developing different stories and, uh, and setting up a different narrative. So um, I'm not a big fan of quota, but I'm a, thing, a big fan of, of raising awareness. And um, by the study, which I didn't do, but which was conducted, uh, um, it, was, it was made crystal clear that we need to have changes because we're everyone or every marginalized group is not represented well. Um, And so I think we have to, we, we don't have to be convinced. I mean, we know what we're talking about, but many others have to. And um, I don't know, the, our, ministry of, our minister, um, minister of Culture just a few days ago said that diversity and is one of the eight pillars of a future uh, funding po uh, politic. So I hope that um, this will also implement in the, all, the other, um, all the other funds and it will also implement in the national funds so that it changes what we, what we want to change. So, but I, yeah, I think that at least there has to be, some, has to be th something that raises awareness if it's a quota or if it's a checklist or whatever you might call it, but which tells us that the most stories are told from a very narrow perspective. I think... Um What's, what needs to be tackled before we can get there, though, is data collection. And that's something that we've seen that the European side of the film industry is really resistant to. They don't 
want to, and in some countries it's even illegal to ask for the identities of everyone who's on the, the team of a film. Um, and so that's then, that meant then makes this work very difficult because if you don't know who is behind a project, then you can't count numbers and you can't um, push forward the stories that um, need to be told. You can't investigate whether something's authentic, um, whether it's originating from the community that's, that it's about. Um, so these are, this is an issue that needs to be sort of addressed um, industry-wide. Um, and this was the topic of a seminar that we had at the beginning of the EFM just a few days ago, led by Temba Bebe. Um, so you can look that up, I think, in Variety. It was called the Pathways Seminar. Um, so about quota, um, it could work, it could be negative. So for instance, if they were to say, okay, we need like 10 trans people, you might end up with 10 trans people like me, you know, and they might just take them as whites um, from a specific background. So is it really working? I'm not sure. Where you can maybe do the quota is to give them the position of, um, instead of being hired, hiring. So they will hire. That's maybe where you can put the quota, to give them that position where maybe you can put them in, a, you know, all these diversity, hire, whatever, can be um, higher up. Like, if it's only runners, then is it really, you know, are you really making the right change? Um, if you're just hiring, let's say, a consultant, um, to review the story and not as a writer, are you really making the change? I don't know, because there's also this idea of um, um, when, you, when you hire someone, you wanna give them, you wanna empower them in a way that is first of all with the, the right credit and where they are in like, again, we're talking about position of, you know, um, putting them in, a, in the right, I don't know how to say this, in a high position. Um, but then you also wanna give them, you know, this, um, there's this issue with like financial stability. You wanna make sure that they're paid right because when someone is paid right, that means that there's, you know, uh, they get a shelter. Uh, for some, they get to um, transition. Uh, they get to have access to healthcare. They get to have access to um, just everything might be better. So yes, it has to, yes, you need to have those diversity hires, but it needs to be like outside of just the assistant, the runner, uh, the consultant that you hire, you know, two days before uh, shooting, just to double check everything was all right, and then you can say, hey, I've hired a consultant. You know, it has to be like, yeah. So yes and no, because then it can go into this, like hiring the same type of people just to fit your quota, but not like actually different within those minority groups. Yeah, no, I think it all starts with, I mean, with and, and my and what I can say, the producer and the director, because they are the, well, if you consider them to be the heads of a production, speaking of a film, so if they push forward whatever you, whatever diversity agenda you have, um, then it's they will automatically find those allies in the team, within the team, um, that they want to have around them. And we just tried to finish shooting a film um, in December, which was, which was a queer director, queer producer, um, trans, non-binary um, co-writer, um, and then from there, it was um, it was the queerest team I ever worked in, and that uh, I mean it was obviously great, and um, and it set a totally different atmosphere even for those who are not part of the queer community, and who are not part of the well we we had so many other <laughs> we had so many we had such a great multi diverse team which um, which made filmmaking and this was some, something that I really appreciated made filmmaking. A different kind of experience because it was actually much more a collective experience. So this is why I said it starts with the director and producer because at the in the beginning they are on top, but um, ideally during the course of the film they are not anymore. And this all that goes well if the team is just uh, yeah, like that. Yeah, I think where I've seen change being made um, is when queer and trans and BIPOC people are in leadership positions and are hiring other folks in those, of those identities also in hiring positions, and then you see a transformation. Um, I was thinking about what you were talking about of allowing um, 
filmmakers and our industry um, at every level to be to have sustainable careers and not be sort of chasing these small consulting fees and crumbs and adding up like multiple gigs to try and make a salary. And I, I would really love to see arts organizations um, uh, sort of fostering community, fostering um, queer storytellers by providing like a year long support, financial support, almost like a, I guess a salary, like a monthly uh, stipend so that our storytellers can focus on working on their craft and not writing grant applications and applying to things. It's, it takes so much time to do that and it takes time away from what they want to be doing. So let's support them to be able to, to work on whatever it is, whatever story it is they want to be telling. And also this is what uh, Toni Morrison calls uh, that the function of repression is uh, distraction. You know, so you're always distracted by things you have to solve to then do your job actually. And so also um, to build bridges or to uh, make uh, a, a living or like a job more easier for people who have been like excluded from so many structures because of power dy dynamics is so important. And also like what you, what you just said with, um, so the team was queer, so then the, cast and the crew also was queer, I absolutely have the same um, um, uh, experience. I, I was um, at a set uh, last year as an anti-discriminatory uh, consultant and um, it was a black queer German filmmaker and um, she did an incredible job by providing actually a safe space or safer space on set because there is always, when we talk about diversity, we always have to talk about discrimination and also like um, structures that are not safe. So if we demand change and ask for quota, for example, we have to ask, okay, and what about the structure the people come in? So what, what change has to be done there also? Yeah, and I would uh, like to hear your thoughts on this, but before you had something else. I was just, um, no. Maybe I, I can just answer that because uh, it has uh, it's connected with that. But um, I think you you already provided the answer. It has to be a safe space. And, um, and how how do we do that? I mean, we do that if, um, by I mean by including a lot of people who know what we're talking about, who have the same experience, and also um, showing those who are not part of this particular group um, to. How, how how change can work because we, and and that means um, maybe even talk a lot. I, we had not all of of our team members were queer, and some of them um, didn't have a lot of exposure. I might say to queer people before, and then it was uh, kind of um, just seeking the conversation and to 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 be able to to welcome them to our community the other way around, and um, that was also a very rewarding um, experience because then even those felt like allies after two days, three days, four days, maybe a week, they felt very strongly connected to the community and um, that made the, the team also very, uh, a safer place. And you have to, if, you, if you're working with um, white male, cis men, um, find the right ones because it's, it's I mean, there, there are good ones around, so um, find those who are not toxic. Um. Maybe we could create a list of the <laughs> 10, be a short list. five, uh, three. Let's see. Uh, what you said made me think about at every festival that I've worked at, I've always, um, at every opportunity, brought in um, colleagues whenever there was uh, a paying gig, right? So um, probably at this point, half of the programmers of Color Collective have worked with me on some um, festival or artist development program. And um, I did that with joy, wanting to be surrounded by people I love and respect. And what, I've, what I have now come to see is that bringing BIPOC folks and queer and trans folks, gender diverse folks into oppressive power structures at predominantly white institutions hasn't necessarily been the best thing for any of us. And so now I'm sort of questioning that route and thinking about like what else can we build that's not um, 
these conventional, very mainstream spaces where we can look out for each other. Because if I'm, if I'm um, filling the programming team with you know, folks that look like all of us and then um, we're not being treated with care, um, it becomes a very toxic environment, um, a very um, draining and harmful environment. And um, that's, that's, not, that's not the environment that any of us can do great work in. Um, I think that, oh, there's a, there's a manifesto that you can find online. It's written decades ago um, called the Kumbahi River Collective um, that talks about if the, least, if the most oppressed people are in power, then they will create the change that needs to come. So that means if you, uh, if you have a leadership position open and you hire a, a black, queer, disabled woman in that role, she will do the work that needs to be done to create it an accessible and um, safe space for everybody because she'll be thinking about the blind spots that no one else is thinking about. Um, when when I, I look at the, the lack of stories about us at festivals, even here, um, unfortunately, I see that there's still so many queer and trans stories that haven't been made yet, and, and that's why I think it's so urgent to figure out solutions. And I don't know what they are, but I'm, you know, I, I, I'm keen to talk with all of you and hear what your thoughts are, why you wanted to be here today and um, what your needs are so that we can all put our heads together and, and find out solutions. That's a beautiful invitation, but Alice, you also. Um, I completely agree with both of you. I think it's all about like conversation and trying to bring them in to create more safe space. But I think as well, <clears throat> another big issue that we're facing today, I think I'm gonna talk more about TV here, but um, like the budgets are higher. Um, and interestingly enough, I think we need to put the money, maybe um, split it more equally so that you can, you know, when you're, when you're shooting and you're on a run and you don't have time to hire someone and then there's a mess up and then there's like, and then they hire a consultant and then they don't have that time to have a conversation with someone that now is like, that got discriminated. Um, I think if you, if you put more money into making sure that um, I don't know, um, there's more time behind preparing, more time for um, having like a sit down, more money put into like having conversation after with the cast, the crew, um, hiring, um, you know, as many consultant or intimacy coordinators, depending on like what you're, what you're doing, then, then, then you can create the safe space. So I think, yes, it is for um, production, like on set to create that. But I think it's also about what's happening right now in the industry where the budget, even if it's higher, it's restricted. Um, there's, you know, time constraint. There's all these things that are now like, because of the streamers and the demand and what's going on right now with, you know, uh, the whole shift going on from broadcasters to streamers and AVOD, all that. It's creating, you know, just like anything else you do, like on a daily basis, if you do it, if you rush into it, you will mess up. Whereas if you have more time to, you know, sit back and say, okay, well, let's put maybe, you know, I don't want to talk about like the cost, but yeah, maybe reduce whatever they get their earning and then put it across different departments to then make sure that everyone feels um, treated equally, then yeah, there's like, basically, in order to create more safe space, you need more money and that money is there, but it's just not in the right pockets. If you want to say something, just dive in into the conversation, but not bot. Yes. <laughs> yeah? You want to talk into the microphone? Is there any? Hey, uh, I, just because you mentioned TV, because there's, uh, I think, uh, a big difference if it's like a commercial money earning uh, thing or not. Uh, like in Germany, we like really see the difference between like uh, the public broadcasters and the, the, the private broadcasters. And I really have like no big idea how you uh, use 
you suggested they would have to like adjust their bottom line, but uh, how do we bring the private and the commercial people to adjust like their bottom line because uh, there there won't be having any quotas or st or stuff like that. So I I, I completely agree, and I think that's more for um, like broadcasters and. Um, those want to have that conversation. We're just, you know, this is just a proposal saying like the issue is that now there's way more um, like time constraint and, and the budget and this need because there's so much to watch, then that means as well that everyone is trying to fight to keep either the, you know, the audience in. So if you're, we're talking about like Netflix, for example, they need to sustain that demand. Uh, but if we're talking about broadcasters, that's a different conversation, obviously. But it's, it's all about, like, because we're such in a rush of um, keeping the audience and, and, and the money and all that, then you start thinking about diversity after. Um, and that's an issue just in general. It's kind of the same in film, like, uh, especially in the UK, uh, less in other countries. But yeah, it's, it's just like where there's this issue of having to, like, and, and this applies to also like all white cast, right? We see that some people do get, like there's always um, some issues on set because there's all these constraints that are happening because of increase of demand and audience and all these things that you need to keep in, in mind, which is make more money. Mm. Can I, I would um, like to also um, share a th thought with you because um, I was thinking, because you also um, asked it in, in a, in a, in a um, different uh, way, but I was wondering wh why. No, stop. I have to th rethink again because I'm 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 pretty amazed by everybody who's here now um, sitting because at a certain point there is a lot of res resistance because you say okay we're not playing the game because it's not not just about money it's about access you know who's allowed to do what and at a certain point you said no we're not playing in the game. We're going to do something else. Nobody wants to tell our stories. I'm going to tell it. I'm going to start a production company. I'm going to start this. And I'm going to do a, you know, like a distribution and so on. Like it's at a certain point where you say, OK, I'm going to do my own festival. <laughs> you know, you, you do it. So it's, um, it's, it's a way of resisting power structures. And I don't want to go into like philosophical um, excourses, but there is Antonio Gramsci also talking about power structures within society and also he hegemonic um, constructions and so on. And for example, he claims it's not about the people who are in these positions, about, but it's about a critical thinking. It's about the aim to deconstruct what was there before to have actual change. And I would uh, really love to share your thoughts because it's a way of Widerständigkeit and resistance here. Yeah, that makes me think about um, programming a festival and how oftentimes the programming team is really uh, thinking deeply about these things, these factors, thinking critically about um, the origins of every project that's being evaluated, um, whether, it's, whether it feels authentic and accurate or exploitative. And I think that at a certain point, though you realize that that labor is only being done by the programming team and there's many other departments within a festival organization or an arts organization that doesn't care about their things, those things, they're thinking about ticket sales. Um, and so I, I think I, I'm leaning towards the idea that we need to be gravitating towards our own spaces, like queer specific spaces where um, because those will be more progressive, right? Because we know the stories that we need, that we want, um, and those mainstream spaces don't care enough to think critically enough about them. So just to, to answer like your question, how can, since you're talking about um, you know, the queer community having to do itself, how can, for example, I help, how can we help with um, w what we have right now for you? Like, I'm happy to hear. 
I guess um, we should identify wh where are those spaces where our community is already gathering? Mm -hmm. Where do we already feel safe um, to congregate and to, com to convene with each other? And, um, and those are the places where we can create events and, and um, event screenings, conversations, um, without the, the power constraints that exist elsewhere. So it's not about like putting something on and saying, please come. It's about coming to that place and creating the work for everyone to enjoy. I really appreciate your question, Alice, because it's, I mean, this is, we're all part of some kind of networks we created or we support, and um, we just have to expand those networks because we, we're all working from different kind of angles and to, in order to, to get even stronger and to create a, a safer space and to include all different stages of film production, distribution, vis visibility, I think w there should be an even wider network of the networks. And this is probably, I mean, no, this is, it's all about uh, knowing that we're around and empowering ourselves and um, making our lives more joyful, because that's what you said in the beginning, and I like this a lot. Um, it's, it's, um, I mean, the film industry can be quite, ch or is quite challenging, and, but in the end we all chose this path because we wanted to tell stories, we wanted to be enablers for stories and people who want to tell these stories and so um, networking or connecting and even sharing and, and helping each other is I prob probably one of the, you asked how a little bit earlier, this is probably how, so uh, one way to do it and then we just have to find the money. <laughs> yeah, so because I, I found it uh, quite uh, wonderful what you just said, you know, like uh, networking, being together, and then starting a bigger network. So one of the way to deconstruct also like this competition is to have less competition, more community. Mm -hmm. I, li I love this thought. No, that's, that's true actually. You know, it's like whatever you know, and, and I think that's why we're trans on screen, like we're kind of um, pushing for more um, meetups and, and networking event, because it's like whatever you know, you might want to share it to someone. Or if at some point, and you know you don't want to be the only person in the room from that specific category. It's it's not a nice feeling. Um, and so when you're working on let's say a project, you might be thinking, oh my god, this person I met the other day that is like a like trans makeup artist would be so great for this role. You know, and it's like the more you communicate and connect and and have all those networking events, then you can also do that within, but also you can share specific, like I said, skills or even. You know some life advice or like some advice as well that might help like actually don't work with this person because they did this or you know there was this one time where we received um a job uh it was for like someone was looking for a writer for a specific um project and then i shared this across um you know our all our writers and then one of them said be careful when you're whoever you know is going to come back to you saying i want this job make sure you mention this, 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 this. And I'm not a writer, this person was a writer and gave incredible advice. And when we shared this across uh, the writers that wanted to get that job, immediately they knew what to say or how to do it because the person that gave the ad advice have worked on like high-end TV shows and they knew exactly what to do and what to say. And, and that you know helped so many people to make a decision and to be like, I'm gonna pull out or other were like, okay, cool, I'm gonna come with my agent and talk about this, this and this and this, you know? So it's like, it was, it was great, it was beautiful to see that. One person saw it and said, no, mention this. And, and, and that's the beauty of like those, you know, connections and contacts you make. Because it's like, one experience will, yeah, one person can, yeah, bring something positive well, all the time, but like, yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Naomi, and I'm from a company called Lesflix. Um, I've loved the fact here, in obviously about the whole point that it's when we come together and connect that we can do more. Um, and obviously, a few people have said, "What can we do to come together?" Um, it's something I've always been looking at, and I do believe that the mainstream is really important for getting us allies and learning um, to, to help bring people along with our journey and understand that we are normal people, we do exist, um, but we don't get the depth of the stories, we don't get the authenticity, um, and that's often what our audiences are craving and I think a big disconnect is that 
unfortunately, our audiences do not understand that you will not get these. And so the first question you always get is, is it on Netflix? And I think the thing is, you know, actually helping our audiences to understand that if you want that, you have to go into networks, safe spaces. And I think if we want the authenticity, we have to stop expecting the mainstream to have it because there is always going to be a quota. Netflix has a 10 quota on lesbian films, one in, one out. And I think they are important and they play their pace, but they're also all sexualized. Um, and so, if, I mean, I would say if anyone wants to, we're always looking to collaborate. And I think um, finding those networks, for me, there's definitely barriers. We're a UK based country and my country voted for Brexit for some stupid reason, um, which, you know, again, Im immediately creates barriers. And I think the thing is, as a community, we are quite disparate, we're disconnected. Um, little things like you can't target on social media for our demographic, because we give that data away to all of these companies, but we can't then target using it. So um, I, I will welcome anyone who wants to collaborate or connect. Um, we're building a business model that financially does support the industry. We're on a very early days of our journey, but it's really important for us that we build a sustainable business model that works for the industry. Um, one of the biggest costs is distribution, is marketing. We know that. So for me, from the day we built the, the platform, it's about making sure the audience can find what they're looking for in one central, easy to put place. The advice we were hearing from the mainstream was if you don't get distribution, do it yourself. Why is everyone competing for an audience when no one watches one film all year? So I think, again, I think how we connect those networks is really important. Um, and so if anyone wants to collaborate, but I'd say, what are the barriers? Because I think for me, the, the big challenge has always been this whole like expectation that like until you become Netflix, you're not big enough. I've had a lot of conversations on Twitter where you're like, oh, you're not big enough. And I'm like, well, how are we ever going to get bigger if you have to wait until we're big enough to support? So do any of you find that barrier or what are the barriers or what could others be doing to kind of, I guess, help to kind of, I guess it's about explaining the potential, how we help people to understand that you have to support stuff from the ground up not find the stuff that's already successful because I think that is what it basically playing into the power a lot is kind of going oh well when that's successful I'll jump on that one and it's like she realizing that for that one project that we support we may have lost 20 or 30 mm -hmm. that never quite got big enough for the support that's needed yeah thank you any questions any answers I mean, it's, ideas, it's difficult because that means you as an individual you also have to be strong enough to think I'm big enough. You know, it's it's like all about like how you see yourself. Because if you're comparing yourself as I'm big enough once I've hit Netflix, then yeah, that's that's an issue. And yeah, I don't know. I think it's good that now there's um like you mentioned Netflix. Like I think the more non-mainstream platforms or um like you know you were talking about programmers and like the queer media like. Once you have all these different channels, then maybe you can be big enough. But I think it's also like about like a personal journey and accepting that you are big enough. And and that's something you can only do yourself, I think, with obviously the right um, people around you reminding you that you're great enough. I wonder if there's other kind of like-minded um ethical organizations and um, similar industry groups that you can align yourselves with. So it's Le Lesflix and XYZ, and then together you'll have a little bit more power and connection among the industry. Something to think about. <laughs> I'm still thinking about uh, this term, to be big enough. And it's super frustrating, and it's like playing in the game, and I'm asking, is this the right way? Should we play in the game, or should we just be like, we are there? <laughs> so it's, you know. Yeah, I was, going, I, I was going to say this, because it's, it's, it's for, from my point of view, the wrong measure. I mean, to measure yourself by, by, by being big, in terms of being on, being, Netflix is accessible or something. It's, I think I, I really like what you say. You have to, we all are big enough. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But I think we, we all as a community should, should, um, should, um, should, um, 
not play the game. And and it's not about it's we have to set up different measurements, I think. It's not it's not the way that and, and um I mean, societies all around the world, we are changing. And I, I still believe in to the good, uh, at least in some places of the world. And um, so, and in order to, to change, we have to just break up with the measures that existed or have been existing. So, um, bigness in terms of the industry is not a me cannot be a measure anymore when we want to enable ourselves. So, yeah. That's what I think, and so let's not phrase, or let's not use those phrases anymore. We just start f defining our own bigness. Yeah, because I think in, in like this industry is all about like, well, it used to be, I think now things are less glamour than they used to be, but it was like, you know, you wanted to, people got into the film industry to become a star, to become this, to become that, to have, you know, all these things, and then, you realize this is actually the wrong reason why you're in this industry, you know, if you, if you start thinking about that. Um, and I think, well, one thing that Netflix does pretty okay with, I would say, is like when they hire, when you, when you watch, you know, different TV shows or films, you can see like some of the actors, you've never seen them before. Um, and, and that's pretty cool. That's one thing that is pretty cool because before we used to have, you know, that one same actress that would play all roles, including, you know, um, Southeast Asian uh, characters, um, and and you know it would be quite like interesting to see how well it's interesting to see how now that's at least changing. At least now for actors, there's way more opportunities. Uh, now let's see if that's going to be the same, you know, for for others. Um, yeah. I just wanted to say that um, something you probably have in your favor that Netflix doesn't is that you're a curated platform, so you're handpicking work that you believe in, whereas Netflix has disclosure alongside Ricky Gervais and Dave Chappelle. So <laughs> just play that quality up, let your audience know this is where to find good lesbian content. And while thinking about um, changing the structure, I was... Um, thinking about uh, Adrian Marie Brown, do you know this person? Uh, they are amazing and they uh, wrote so many books also about um, change and um, one was Emergence Strategy and they, claim, they say, um, if we think about the world, do we imagine it as a place where there are winners or losers? Or do we imagine that there is a place where none of these categories exist? So having a vision and also when it comes to queering things, maybe we should stop thinking about, you know, big, small, um, you know, like good, bad. Uh, you know what I mean? Like this, all this constructed with uh, w with which we are like socialized and um, think maybe queering is then subversive and out of a place of community love and care. Maybe this could be like a resistance, getting in the structure with, I don't know. What, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I had a very impressive speaker a few days ago, Gemma Desai, speak about um, her approach to programming at the Berwick Film Festival in the UK. And she talked about um, removing the language of oppression from festivals, so like not using submission or jury or, or even awards, so that ties into what you were saying. Um, I think you can find her, um, uh, her sort of guiding principles for programming that festival online. They published a beautiful piece, um, and yeah, everything she says is brilliant, so I recommend you Google her, Gemma Desai. That's actually so interesting, like this idea of removing words that are and like, even if we were to do, let's say, awards, we can think of like the film where everyone felt, you know, um, like everyone felt comfortable, or like you know, you could you could actually see what movies was made in the most ethical way, in the uh, non um, damaging for the climate, uh, for the yeah environment. Sorry, uh, the one which uh, you know, um, like you can see, you can recreate as well awards based on actual progress and not the best movie because at the end of the day we're not going to agree um and same with actors you know like rather than the actor that you know um best actress or best actor or best whatever it can be like the actor that overcame this and you talk about a challenge that also is hard to understand because when we watch a movie we don't see like you know the like the the the, 
bottom of the iceberg, we just see the movie, but then there were so many challenges that you encounter while you're filming. So why not focus on these rather than just best, 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 and it's just like people. So then how, how, do, how do we do this then? How do we go out of this today and change the system? <laughs> Let's call for action. <laughs> Well, you can create a festival with that type of award. <laughs> Actually, uh, the Queer Media Society is setting up um, the Queer Media Awards, but we're just in the making of it, and now that you talk about it, I think we just, we just change uh, the titles. Yeah, no, but because it makes me thinking, and you're absolutely right. I mean, why should we always be the... Because I was just saying, don't, let's, don't big ourselves. So why, what is the best anyway? I mean, what is the measurement for being the best? And then, and all the others are not the best. So it's very exclusive or excluding, and um, that's exactly the opposite of what we want. So thank you for your idea, and it, I think it comes at the absolute right time. No, it's, it's yeah. fine. So let's just talk about this more. Yeah, because it, it reminds me of this. Uh, there was one award which was, um, you know, for location managers. So I think they are kind of a... Uh, no one really sees the work that they do, but it's actually so insane and incredible. And like film commissioners have so much to do. And, and you know, you'll just see a logo at the very end of the movie if you do finish the movie um, in the credits, you know. Um, and, and there was like this um, award, which was um, the best use of location. And the way it worked, it was quite interesting because it was like for you to submit or to be part of that award or whatever, you had to say what you used the location for. and what was hard and what wasn't. And I thought that was quite interesting because you're actually deconstructing as well, like awards and like hyping people that for so long have just never been invited to these awards or festivals or whatnot, you know, because it's again, the same type of people. Lucy, what do you see, <laughs> think? How do we change it tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the honest answer is I don't know, and I'm trying to figure it out. So if any of you have ideas, please tell me. <laughs> um, I, I just want to continue to find ways to bring all of us together, mm -hmm. wherever we are. Um, and, and I love the, the thoughts that you've both shared. Yeah, I also um, thought it, it was, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you and uh, sharing thoughts and also um, having like this depth of conversation also, not changing right now, not having solutions, but uh, kind of triggering thoughts and going deeper into different contexts within our different contexts. And I'm super happy that uh, you've been here with uh, your thoughts, your love, your care, and uh, all of it. And thanks for Teddy for inviting. Thanks, uh, Bartholomew, for curating and also putting so much love uh, into this. And uh, yeah, have a lovely day and uh, let's queer everything. <laughs> <laughs>